In the last part of today's lecture, we're going to derive a, a full deep Q learning algorithm. So here's the full fitted Q iteration method that we saw before. We could generalize this in the same way that we generalize batch remote actor critic into an online algorithm to get an online Q learning method. So the online Q learning method would take a single action and observe a transition S A S prime R. It would compute a target value on that single transition, R plus gamma, times max over A prime of Q phi S prime A prime. And then it would take one gradient step to minimize error between the estimated Q values, Q phi S A, and the target value Y. So this is like the online version of actor critic, only for Q values. It takes one, one step in the environment, observes one transition, computes one target value, and then takes one gradient step of SGD. This is sometimes referred to as Watkins Q-learning. It's a very classic algorithm for Q-learning that essentially forms the basis of modern deep Q-learning methods. But to get this to actually work well in practice, we need to modify it in several ways to address some major shortcomings that this method has when combined with deep neural networks. Um, so one choice we have to make is how do we choose the actions? Now this algorithm is off policy, meaning that you don't have to choose the actions with the argmax policy in order for it to work well. So you have many choices. Um, essentially what you want to do is you want to choose actions that perform effective exploration. What does that mean? Well, you could choose actions according to the argmax policy. But this is actually not a very good idea. Take a moment to think about why that might not be a good idea. What could go wrong if you always choose your actions using the argmax policy? Well, the issue is that if you choose your actions using the argmax policy and your initial Q function is very bad, it might erroneously assign a high probability to some really bad action that leads you to a dead end. And if you always choose that action, you might just never see the rest of the environment. You might always do the same bad thing and never find out that there are better things available to you. So what you would like to do in step one is ensure that other actions that are not the action you currently think is best, have some non-zero probability of being chosen. A very common strategy for this is what's called the epsilon greedy exploration strategy. In the epsilon greedy exploration strategy, you pick a small number called epsilon, which is your probability of exploring. And then with probability one minus epsilon, you choose the argmax action. And then with probability epsilon, you randomly select among the other possible actions. So what this means is just with probability epsilon, do something random. With probability of 1 minus epsilon, just do what you think is best. It's kind of like if you're deciding which, which restaurant to go to. You go to your favorite restaurant, and usually you want to do that because you want to go to the place that you like. But with some small probability, you'll just choose another random restaurant to see if that might be better. Another strategy, which is a little bit more sophisticated and a little bit more common uh, in uh, kind of more advanced algorithms, is to use what's called Boltzmann exploration. The idea here is that epsilon greedy is a little bit naive because it doesn't really distinguish among the different actions uh, other than the argmax. There could be some action for which you are certain that, that action is really, really bad, and maybe you just don't want to take it. Boltzmann exploration sets the probability of different actions to be proportional to the exponential of their Q values, which means that actions that are very good, but are about equally good, have about equal probability of being chosen whereas actions that you know to be extremely bad will have a very low probability of being chosen. So that strategy can work too. Generally, what I might recommend is if you're just starting out and you want some strategy to get you started, use epsilon greedy because it's very simple and it's easy to tune its parameters. All right, what else can go wrong with the basic Q-learning algorithm? Well, one big problem is that in step three, we're taking gradient descent steps, stochastic gradient descent steps. Uh, and we might think that this will just converge, right? Unfortunately, Q-learning is not gradient descent. Remember that the target value Y itself depends on the Q function. But when we compute the gradient step 3, we ignore this. We're treating Y as a constant. So for that reason, Q-learning is not quite regular gradient descent, which means it's not quite so easy to get it to work well. The other big problem is that if you're running online Q-learning, the state that you see at the next time step is going to be similar to the state that you see at the previous time step. So even though 
Step three looks like it's doing stochastic gradient descent. It's not actually correct stochastic gradient descent. Correct stochastic gradient descent requires you to sample your data point IID from your buffer. But the state action next state tuples you get here are anything but IID. They're strongly correlated. And that can cause big problems for stochastic gradient descent. Sequential states are strongly correlated and your target value is always changing. So this can get you into a lot of trouble. Let's say that this is your trajectory and you're advancing through that trajectory. Initially, you'll update your Q function on the steps early on. Then you'll update on these points, then these points, then these points. And what might happen is you might repeatedly overfit to those local correlated samples and never actually learn the true function. So you'll just, you'll just coast between different overfitting regimes to different local regions and not capture the global structure because you're not sampling your samples IID. One way to mitigate this is to use what are called replay buffers. The idea is to actually do something a little more similar to the full fit Q iteration, but still have it retain the flavor of an online method. So remember, in full fit Q iteration, we would collect a data set using some policy and then train on that data set many times. In a sense, online Q learning is a special case of this full fit Q iteration algorithm, where k equals 1, where we basically uh, don't alternate between targets and regression, and there's only one gradient step in step three. And that gives us the, the online Q-iteration Q algorithm. Now remember that any policy will work as long as it has broad support. So what we can do is we can modify at the full fit of Q-iteration to load data from a buffer. So we can basically store data as we go, and when it comes time to update, we don't update on the latest transition, we actually load a batch of transitions from all the transitions we've seen so far. So you can kind of think of it as having a bucket of transitions. You keep adding to that bucket as you go, and in the background, you're maybe even in a separate thread, you're updating on that bucket. So now the uh, Q-learning with replay buffers will look like this. Step one, sample a batch of transitions from the buffer that contains all transitions seen so far. Step two, update your Q function on that mini-batch. Now this looks a lot more like mini-batch gradient descent. Your samples are no longer correlated. Uh, and you have multiple samples in the batch, so you're not, you're not doing these single sample SGD updates. But where does the data come from? Um, well, so you need to periodically feed the replay buffer. So what you're going to do is, as you collect data, you keep uh, adding it to the buffer, and if your buffer gets too big, then you throw out the oldest data. And that turns out to be a very good strategy. So for Q-learning with replay buffers, if you want to put it all together, it looks like this. Collect some data using some policy and add it to your buffer. That's this part. Step two, sample a batch from your buffer. Step three, update on that batch using mini batch gradient descent. And then go back to step two. It's very common to not repeat these steps to have k equals one. So basically collect data, add it to buffer, sample from buffer, update, then collect more data. But you could resample and take multiple steps as well. And that can be a little bit more efficient if you want to be really careful in conserving the number of samples. All right. Now there's one more problem that still remains. Q learning is not gradient descent. And the fact that the target value depends on our current Q function can cause us a lot of trouble. It can kind of result in the Q function sort of chasing its own tail in a sense, because the target is always changing. It's trying to hit a moving target. So you can use a replay buffer to solve the correlation problem, but this moving target thing is still an issue. Q learning looks an awful lot like supervised regression, but it's not. The full fit of Q duration algorithm does have step three, which is supervised regression. It takes multiple steps on the same targets, and that part is stable. So what we can do is we can make our online algorithm look a little bit more like full fit of Q duration. And the way that we can do that is by basically slowing down our targets. Right? So in, in fit of Q duration, because we picked our target values and then we regress onto them for many steps, that's a stable regression problem. So here's how uh, we can uh, slow down our target uh, values. We do it using something called target networks. So we collect the data set using some policy, add it to our buffer. We sample a batch from that buffer. And then when we take a, a gradient descent step on that batch, we don't use the same Q phi to compute our target values. We use a different Q phi prime. And the parameters phi prime are obtained by copying the phi parameters 
much, much less often. So you can think of Q5 prime as basically a, an old copy of Q5, a very old copy. And that means that targets don't really change in the inner loop. They change very infrequently. So that means that everything that is happening in step 2, 3, and 4 is just supervised regression. And then step 1 basically changes your regression targets. Um, and this gives us kind of the, the classic deep Q learning algorithm, sometimes also referred to as D, DQN. The classic deep Q learning algorithm takes some action, observes a transition, adds it to the buffer, samples a mini batch from the buffer, computes a target value using the target network Q5 prime, updates by taking one mini batch gradient descent step, and then every n steps, where n is maybe like 10,000, replace phi prime with the latest phi. But remember that this algorithm is just a special case of the more general fit acute iteration uh, recipe. And it's a very old recipe. Uh, but this particular instantiation is you know, particularly simple and popular. It's basically a special case where k equals 1 uh, and uh, n equals 1. Or, sorry, n, n equals uh, 10,000. Okay, so this is the algorithm that, uh, for example, that you might be implementing for, for your homework. Now, so far we talked about algorithms, we didn't really talk about networks or representations. So before we get a complete uh, deep Q learning method, we have to discuss how to actually represent the Q function. And there are a couple of choices. A very classic choice is to represent it as a neural network that takes a state of an action as an input and output, outputs a scalar valued Q value. This is more common with continuous actions. Another choice is to have a network that, out, that inputs a state and outputs a separate number for every possible action. And this can be very convenient with discrete actions, because then it's very convenient to take a max. In Q-learning, you're constantly taking this max, so if your neural network outputs all the values with a single forward pass, it's very easy to get that max. Um, now, as an aside, let me briefly go back to actor critic. The online Q-duration algorithm that I described so far, including the version where you add uh, replay buffers and target networks, can be very inconvenient to use with continuous actions. With discrete actions, it's great, because the max is very easy to compute. With continuous actions, it can be inconvenient, although not impossible, mostly because of the max. Because if you have continuous actions, that max actually requires a continuous optimization. We can do this, and I'll actually show an example at the end of this lecture of an algorithm that does do exactly this, but it's a little tricky and a little bit inconvenient. So if you have continuous actions, it's actually much more convenient in practice to use actor critic. But if you want to retain the off-policy nature of Q-learning and still use actor critic, you can actually do actor critic with Q functions. And that can work very, very well. It's actually the foundation of most widely used modern actor critic algorithms. Um, so it's very nice for it to be off-policy. If you want an off-policy actor critic algorithm, here's the recipe. Take some action and observe a transition, add it to your buffer, sample the mini batch from that buffer, and now compute your target value, but instead of taking the max, use an actor network pi prime theta. Basically assume that pi prime theta is close enough to a max. Then take a gradient step on the critic, just like in Q-learning, and then take a gradient step on the actor using policy gradient. And then update the target uh, network for the Q function, and there's also a target network for the actor every n steps. So this is an off-policy Q function version of actor critic. It actually works really well, and it's the foundation of very widely used algorithms like soft actor critic that are kind of the standard for continuous actions. But for discrete actions, you really don't need the actor, and Q learning actually works really well. Okay, some practical tips for Q learning. If you actually want to use deep Q learning in practice, you know, the, the material in this lecture gives you kind of the theory, the background, but to implement in practice, there are a few tricks you need. First, Q-learning takes a lot of care to stabilize. If you just code it up as I described and you run it, probably the first thing that you'll see is that performance will go up a little bit and then it will drop and then it will uh, be really bad and then your algorithm won't work. So tuning hyperparameters for Q-learning tends to be a lot more time consuming than for regular supervised learning. It's a good idea to just test on easy, reliable tasks first, tasks that are very simple, like maybe tasks with one-dimensional state or a grid world, to make sure that your implementation is actually correct. Um, so, you know, here are some actual examples of learning curves where the x-axis is the number of samples and the vertical axis is the actual performance of the policy for some Atari games from a paper from 2015. You can see that some of the games, like Pong, which is really easy, 
go up and then stay up, but some other games like Video Pinball and Venture, they keep going up and down and oscillating. So it's very important to debug your algorithm on really simple tasks to make sure it's correct before trying it on the harder tasks, because there, things might not be so straightforward. Large replay buffers tend to help improve the stability of Q-learning, so don't be afraid to use replay buffers with as many as a million or more transitions. And it basically makes it look more like fit acute duration. It addresses those uh, correlated sample and uh, issues. And in general, Q-learning can take time. It might be no better than random for a long time, and then it might start to go up. And this is because Q-learning has an exploration challenge. So with regular supervised learning, if you visualize your learning curve, you'll probably see that right away things get really good and then take a long time to, uh, to, to reach maximal performance. So it's like rapid progress early on, then slower and slower progress. With Q-learning, you see something different. You see more of an S-shaped curve, where for a long time nothing happens. And during that time, it's basically that random exploration trying to discover good behaviors. And once it finds some good behaviors, you usually see rapid improvement, and then things uh, plateau again. And you can kind of see that in the Pong and breakout plots at the top. For this reason, it helps to start with high exploration, a larger value of epsilon, and then gradually decrease it as learning progresses. So typically, you would use some decay schedule. You would maybe set epsilon to be a function of the current iteration, where it starts really large at first and then gradually falls off. 